There are three main types of planets in the universe people are usually familiar with. Rocky planet, ice giant, and gas giant. These three major categories are then divided into further subcategories. Hot Jupiters, mini Neptunes, carbon planets, ocean worlds, and many more. But then, there are types of planets that don't really fit into any one category, and so need their own. And the best example I can think of is puffball planets. Puffball planets are extremely weird. Essentially, they're any planet with an extremely low density. I'm sure you've heard that Saturn is less dense than water, and so could float if there was a body of water big enough to hold it. Puffball planets take this to the ultimate extreme, with some having densities comparable to things like styrofoam. At first, this may not seem terribly interesting. It's just a planet with a lower than usual density. But puffball planets are a lot more than that. There's an entire spectrum of puffball worlds across the universe, and we still don't have a very good idea as to how they form. These are a lot more than just planets with weird densities, which is what prompted me to make this video in the first place. This video will go over a few of the most interesting puffball planets we've discovered, and some theories as to how these worlds came into existence. But first, we need to talk about hot Jupiters. Hot Jupiters and puffball planets are related to one another. Lots of puffball worlds across the universe are also hot Jupiters, including the famous 51 Pegasi b, which is officially named Domitium. Domitium was the first exoplanet we found around a sun-like star, and despite being only half the mass of Jupiter, it's bigger than Jupiter in radius. This makes Domitium the first puffball planet we've ever discovered. But Domitium is far from the only hot Jupiter with an overinflated radius. The exoplanet WASP-121b, officially named Tylos, is about 10% bigger than Jupiter in mass, but 70% bigger in radius. And the hot Jupiter Ditso, or WASP-17b, takes us to the ultimate extreme. Ditso has a mass similar to Domitium, but is over twice as large as Jupiter in radius. This makes Ditso one of the largest planets we know of in the universe by radius, and it's not even half Jupiter's mass. The hot Jupiter Boca Prins, or WASP-39b, is even smaller. Boca Prins is just 28% of Jupiter's mass, but a full 120% of Jupiter's radius. These overinflated hot Jupiters are also known to host some weird weather patterns. The Hubble Space Telescope was able to create a simulation of the temperature variations on Tylos, finding gigantic cyclones on the day side in a constant state of forming and being destroyed. It's the most detailed weather map of an exoplanet ever made. Ditso was also discovered as clouds made of vaporized silicon dioxide by JWST. Ditso has clouds made of vaporized quartz. Of course, having clouds made of vaporized rock should tell you that these planets are extremely hot. They're called hot Jupiters for a reason, after all. The temperatures of Domitium, Tylos, and Ditso are all measured in the thousands of degrees. They all orbit extremely closely to their stars. Both Domitium and Ditso take about four days to orbit their stars, Helvidios and Diwo, respectively. Tylos takes us one step further, taking over one day to orbit its star, Dilmun. These huge temperatures are likely the reason these planets are so large. When gases heat up, they tend to expand. All three of these planets are gas giants, and so their atmospheres expand when heated. However, not every hot Jupiter becomes a puffball planet. The planet HD 189733b, for example, is about 10% bigger than Jupiter in both mass and radius, giving it a much more normal density. The hot Jupiter Astrolabos, or WASP-43b, is 70% bigger than Jupiter in mass, but actually smaller than Jupiter in radius. Most hot Jupiters seem to be split between being puffballs and not being puffballs. Why is that? To start, it's usually because of the mass of the planet, as well as its temperature. Domitium and Ditso are just half the mass of Jupiter, but larger planets like Astrolabos and HD 189733b have stronger gravities and so have an easier time pulling their atmospheres down. But Tylos is a similar size to HD 189733b, and it's a puffball, so size is not the only factor. It also has to do with the temperature and the planet's orbit. Hotter planets will have their atmospheres expand more, while planets with higher masses have a tendency to pull down their atmospheres more, lowering their radius. Tylos has a high mass, but this is cancelled out by the fact it's significantly closer to its star than the other planets I've mentioned. Speaking of orbits, many puffball planets actually have pretty weird orbits. The puffball planet Azye has a retrograde orbit. This means it orbits in the opposite direction its star rotates, which is extremely weird. All the planets in the solar system orbit prograde, or the same direction as the sun rotates, and so do the vast majority of planets in the universe. Retrograde planets are very rare, and so having a retrograde hot Jupiter puffball planet is exceedingly unlikely, and we only know of a few of them. Of course, this is because larger planets on short orbits are easier to see by most methods of planet detection, so it makes sense we've seen such unlikely worlds already. But the weird orbits of some puffball planets don't even end there. This is Poiera, or WASP-79b, a planet about 90% the mass of Jupiter but twice Jupiter's radius. Poiera orbits an F-type star called Montuno on an orbit that takes about 3.6 days to complete. But Poiera doesn't orbit along the star's equator like most planets do. Due to the way protoplanetary disks form, all major planets should form along the star's equator, as that's where the majority of material will collect. 
That's the reason all the solar system planets orbit on the same plane. Even the retrograde planets like Azie at least orbit on their star's equators. But not Poiera. Poiera is on a polar orbit, meaning it orbits at almost a 90 degree angle from the star's equator. If retrograde planets were unlikely, polar planets are essentially unheard of. There's really no way for a planet to form on an orbit like this unless it was somehow pushed onto it by some other gravitational force like another planet. We really have no idea how Poiera got like this, and the fact that it's a puffball only makes it more interesting. But even with all these weird orbits, that's not the main reason these planets become puffballs. Temperature seems to be the most important factor here. A balance of the right size and temperature is needed to create these planets, which is why puffball planets seem to get rarer as the mass increases. But because the gas needs to be hot to expand, colder versions of these worlds should be impossible. At least, that's what we thought. Kepler-51 is a sun-like star around 2,600 light-years away from Earth. It's orbited by three known planets, Kepler-51b, c, and d. These planets are about three, four, and five times more massive than Earth respectively, so significantly smaller than the puffball planets so far which have all been around Jupiter's size. At least, they are in mass, not in radius. All three Kepler-51 planets are puffballs, and they have some of the lowest densities ever found on a planet. Kepler-51b, despite being about 3.6 times more massive than Earth, is slightly less than twice the radius of Neptune, a planet 17 times more massive than Earth. It's also significantly colder than the rest of the puffball planets, with temperatures measured in the hundreds of degrees, not the thousands. Kepler-51c is even bigger, with a radius bigger than Neptune's despite being only 4.5 Earth masses. And Kepler-51d is by far the strangest of them all, with a radius nearly identical to Saturn's, a planet almost 16 times more massive than it. To make things even weirder, Kepler-51d, from what I can tell, likely only has a temperature a bit higher than 100 degrees Celsius, which is nowhere near hot enough to produce a planet this big like other puffballs. There are very few other examples of planets like this. Kepler-87c might be a colder puffball similar to these worlds, but I can't find any good sources about it. But even if Kepler-87c is similar, the fact that there are three puffballs all in the same system should show that Kepler-51 is special. I can't find any good theories as to how the Kepler-51 planets got to be the way they are today, but something in the system must be causing the planets to become puffball planets if there are three separate instances of it. There's also the possibility that these planets have thick ring systems that are causing us to overestimate their sizes, but this seems unlikely. Unfortunately, the Kepler-51 planets have pretty long orbits, with Kepler-51d taking 130 days to make one orbit around the star. This makes studying them difficult, as we don't get to see their transits very often, and so don't get good opportunities to see what's in their atmosphere. The system's huge distance away from us only makes this problem worse. 2,600 light-years is a very hard distance to do science at. So, Kepler-51 will remain a mystery for years to come, as there aren't really any good reliable ways to figure out what's going on here. Puffball planets come in an extremely wide variety of types, ranging from only a few times more massive than Earth to more massive than Jupiter, and we still don't know what causes a lot of them to form. Studying hot Jupiter puffballs like Domitium or Tylus will only get us so far, and there's still a ton of unanswered questions, especially around the smaller, colder puffball worlds like Kepler-51d. These types of planets are simultaneously some of the easiest to study, with the short orbits and large radii making them incredibly easy to see, and some of the hardest, with large distances and much smaller sizes. There's still a lot we don't know, and there's also a lot that we do. So, that's why I think these planets are some of the most interesting in the universe, because of the sheer amount of possibilities for exotic environments they could have. Hopefully we can continue to study them as our methods for doing so become more advanced. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed, check out my other videos about space and space colonization.